data from the National Health Laboratory Service in Bramfontein, Johannesburg. We're here to learn more about spinal muscular atrophy, a genetic disorder recently made famous by a family tragedy in England. ENCA's UK correspondent Oli Barrett will fill us in on exactly what happened in the upmarket home of South African couple Tanya and Gary Clarence. And later, I speak to a family in four ways about living with the disease. This is Checkpoint, and I'm Nkepile Mabuse. In the UK, South African mother Tanya Clarence is being treated at a mental health facility after being charged with the murders of her three disabled children. Four-year-old Olivia and her three-year-old twin brothers Ben and Max were found dead in the family's home in New Melden to the south of London. All three suffered from spinal muscular atrophy. ENCA's Oli Barrett has been on the story since it first broke. He brings us disturbing details of the case so far from London. These are the paramedics who were called to the Clarence's house after the three children were found, visibly emotional as they paid their tributes. And in this quiet, wealthy neighborhood just south of London, there has been shock at the deaths. It's just a painful, as a mother, uh, the pain. My children asked where I'd been. I told them I'd gone to go and give some flowers to some children who'd gone to heaven. They asked me what heaven was. I said, I pointed to the sky, and then they said, can we give some flowers to the children? The family home is in New Malden, popular with commuters into the city of London. The Clarences moved in after renovating the house extensively and were helped to care for their three disabled children by two nannies. The property is in a close-knit neighbourhood. We were friendly, yes. We are friendly around here. Very happy family, I'd have thought. But the three little ones that were, were killed were very badly handicapped and going to be worse. The parents were very good parents and they'd got everything they possibly could for those children. They weren't short of money, you can tell by the, the improvements they'd made to the house. If you look at this one beside the next one, the difference is enormous. They spent a lot on repairing the, the house so, and they didn't begrudge any money for the children. One of, one of them I never saw out of a wheelchair and the other two were just scooting around on little, little bikes. 42-year-old South African Tanya Clarence was initially taken from her house to hospital to be treated for minor injuries. She was then arrested and later charged with the murders of her three children. Her husband Gary, an investment banker, was in South Africa with the couple's other child when he learned of the three deaths. After being charged, Tanya Clarence appeared in court twice, the second time here at London's Old Bailey, the central criminal court, for a bail hearing. Her husband Gary arrived at court with Tanya Clarence's lawyers. She appeared via video link from custody in South London. Tanya Clarence wore a black top and black trousers. When her husband Gary saw her appear on screen in court, he smiled up at her. She appeared tired and drawn. She spoke to confirm her name. The prosecution outlined some details of the case when they spoke of the condition her three children suffered from, spinal muscular atrophy. Tanya Clarence began to cry and she remained emotional throughout. The court heard that the probable cause of death was suffocation. The court also heard that one of the family's nannies and a neighbour arrived at the house to check on Tanya Clarence because of a lack of contact. It was the neighbour that found the two boys dead while on the phone to police. Tanya Clarence had blade marks to her wrist. Officers arrived and found Olivia also dead. A series of notes from Tanya Clarence were also found in the house the court heard. The first in Afrikaans, telling Gary Clarence not to take their other daughter, Taya, into the children's or the parents' bedroom. Another to Gary heard the court spoke of the horror of what she had done. Tanya Clarence said in that note she had taken pills but that they didn't work. 
The court also heard claims that after police arrived, Tanya Clarence said to one officer, I'm sorry, I killed them, I suffocated them. At one point, reporters were asked to leave the hearing because of potentially sensitive information. When we returned, we heard the judge's decision on bail. Judge Brian Barker ordered that Tanya Clarence be remanded to a secure mental health facility to the south of London for review and treatment. He said that it isn't bail, but also said this is an exceptional case. The location of her treatment cannot be revealed. As Tanya Clarence receives treatment at a secure hospital, legal teams prepare for the next court date. The next hearing is due to be back here at the Old Bailey. It's expected to take place within the coming weeks and Tanya Clarence could enter a plea at that point. The funerals of four-year-old Olivia and three-year-olds Ben and Max have taken place in private. After the break, the Walsh family in Four Ways, Johannesburg, open up their home and hearts to help us better understand what it's like living with this disease. Like the Clarence family in England, the Walshers in Johannesburg were also blessed with twins. In their situation, the disease got to only one of them, a situation that has its own complications. On the 22nd of October 1997, Johannesburg mother Lindsay Walsh gave birth to seemingly healthy twin daughters, Kerry and Jade. When the girls were approaching a year, she started to pick up a disturbing difference. The, the other twin started crawling and walking and Kerry wasn't doing anything. So we went to the pediatrician and he said she had low muscle tone. We went for a long course of um, physio and OT and the physio eventually said it's not improving at all. So we went back to the pediatrician and I think he knew, but he couldn't tell us. So he sent us to Joburg Den. We had to have, she had to have a, a biopsy in her neck and they said, we will give you the results in six weeks time. And in six weeks time, we had to go back to Joburg Den and they said she has SMA. We had absolutely no idea what that was, never heard of it in my life before. And they didn't really tell us anything about it. They said, go home and phone this number tomorrow and we will answer all your questions. Spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA, is a genetic disorder that limits physical ability such as moving, walking and breathing. It is said to be the most common cause of genetic death among infants, yet many parents only find out that they have the defective gene when they've already given birth. So ask things like, you know, um, when is she going to start crawling? When is she going to start walking? And for some reason, my very last question was, um, how long is she going to live for? I don't even know what made me ask that. And they came back and said, no, she'll never crawl, she'll never walk, and we've probably got two to five years. And I think we went home and I think I cried for the next year. <laughs> um, and I sort of thought, you know, how, I spent the next four years thinking, how are we going to cope when she dies? I was sort of waiting for her to die, and how am I going to cope with that? Kerry didn't die. In fact, she's approaching 17, and she's a typical teenager. Today, her entire family is getting ready to take her to dance and choir practice. I think it's just muscle. Well, for me, it's just muscle, not being able to walk or do everything that a normal teenage girl can do. But I mean, it's... It doesn't really change anything for me, I think. Kiri, because she's never walked, I don't think has ever missed it. The minute we put her in that first wheelchair, she drove it like a champion. She even does drama. My teacher tries to make it as like free as possible, make it easy for me. He's very understanding and when I was going to take drama, mom said to him, and he said, no, he'll do whatever it takes and he'll try as hard as he can to make it easy. I mean, he's had to do a lot of learning and twisting and 
so have I, but I think it's helped to make me more confident and it also made my sister more confident. I mean, she was really shy because it was always me and now she's like open and talks a lot. <laughs> Kerry and Jade are inseparable. They attended junior school at Brindale Primary where adjustments were made to accommodate Kerry. Her mother says finding a high school that would take both girls was a lot more difficult. So we, I, I wrote, started writing to every school there was in the area. And eventually two private schools, not close, eventually said they would take her. And um, we chose Summit College who have been fantastic. And luckily for us, it's a completely flat um, school, so she doesn't have any problems with driving in and out of classrooms. Um, they had already had a disabled toilet there. Perfect school for the girls, but not for the Walsh's finances. We didn't have money for two children to go to a private school. So we fundraised to send Kerry to school, and the school very kindly eventually gave us a bursary of 50% so that Jade could go as well. Just like Tanya Clarence, who now stands accused of killing her three kids suffering from the disease, Lindsay gave up her career as a bookkeeper. I need to be available for her all the time. So yeah, financially it is tough. Um, I think she's been through five wheelchairs, the latest one of which cost a hundred thousand rand. Um, we have had to, we have a special vehicle which had to be adapted. Um, just the ramps are worth 10,000 Rand. The adaption I think was about 25,000. Um, this bed, which was very kindly donated by somebody, but it's probably worth about 50,000 Rand. It's got a, um, a button that can make the head or the legs go up. I mean, these are not treats. It's something that you need to be able to cope with day to day living. The nights are tough. Both parents have to get up several times to turn her. We will pull the sheet towards us. It automatically rolls her body over and then vice versa. If we want to come face this way, we go around to the other side, pull the sheet and she'll roll facing this way again. I don't sleep much <laughs> at all. Like, I roll over a lot, so I wake up to roll over. Between my husband and I, we get up on a good night, about four times a night to roll her over, because she obviously can't roll on her own, and you, you, know, you get comfortable, uncomfortable at night. Um, and on a bad night, when she's, and, you know, sometimes she gets very sore hips, or if she's not feeling too well, then you can get up 10 times a night, trying to make her comfortable. Lindsay says she identifies with Tanya Clarence's pain. When I feel I just can't do anything anymore, I go to my friends and I cry on their shoulders and we have some champagne together and they help me get through this. Maybe she didn't have that. It's important that you have something. I feel desperately sorry for her, um, but I can understand how she felt. I mean, it's extremely hard to cope with one. I can't imagine how she was dealing with three children with SMA. If she's found guilty, I hope they're lenient because inside she's really been punished so much. And the whole family, and I can't understand why they didn't have more people helping them. You, there's no way one person can look after those three children at night on their own. Just no way. Kerry is more concerned about the children whose lives were prematurely ended. I don't know, I'm not like everybody else. I think she deserves to be punished because I feel sorry for the kids. But I understand. I know it's tough for her to be alone. Like my mom's never alone because she has my sister and my other siblings and my dad. But I know it's tough. I mean, me and my mom fight often. I think she's always here when I'm sick, so she only sees that side or has to help me a lot and doesn't get to do what she wants to do. For 16 years, the Walshers have stuck together, determined not to allow SMA to divide them. The strong bond between Kerry and Jade has helped this family cope better. Jade has always been her supporter, always standing there next to her, waiting to pass her what she needs, um, pick up something she's dropped, 
she's she's always been there for her i feel sorry for her sometimes because she doesn't get as much attention as she deserves or and she's always Kerry's sister not jade she's always on my side or willing to help me and she wants to protect me for years, they've survived by focusing on the present. But as the girls approach matric, fears about the future are creeping back in. Because they're twins, you know, Jade's going to be going off to university and getting married, and I don't think Kerry will. And what, how are we going to cope with that? Sorry. So I try not to think about it. And I definitely don't think about her not being here anymore because I just can't. So we just focus on the good stuff. Has it gotten easier or harder? Just uh, harder. In what way? Uh, you know, it, when you're a teenage girl, you want to be beautiful, you know? You want to wear certain... She wants to wear the latest fashionable boots and be like everybody else going off to a disco or something and it's just not possible um, because she's never walked her feet are a, um, very soft like a baby's foot which is so it doesn't go easily into certain in most shoes and she would dearly love to have long boots <laughs> she she loves makeup and jewelry and fashion and um, yeah, she wants to be like everybody else you think about getting married and all that kind of stuff, do you? Yeah, I do, sometimes. Yeah. They gave her two to five years to live, and she has surprised scientists and medical doctors. Who's to say what other hurdles Kerry Walsh will overcome? After the break, a WITS professor working here at the National Health Laboratory Service leads a research aimed at making it easier to detect SMA in people of African origin. In this building behind me, WITS professor Amanda Cross is working on groundbreaking research that has to do with spinal muscular atrophy and African people. For a long time, it was believed that African people were less likely to carry the gene that causes spinal muscular atrophy or SMA. But patients like Noko Lotabete, who recently spoke to ENCA Spongilem Kanimpolweni, kept emerging. Uh, yeah, I don't tell them why. It's there that I mean, I don't do anything. You know? Noko Lo was diagnosed a few days after birth. I couldn't cope. I just felt good. Why me? And it's for the first time with family. Okay, because of that, by that time, once I no mom, what can go assist, whatever ways, go we begin cleaning. A few years ago, scientists at the National Health Laboratory Service found that while SMA is just as prevalent among black people as it is among whites, in about half of black African patients, the disease presents itself differently, genetically meaning available tests can't pick it up. When we have a referral of a white child or an Indian child to our laboratory, we can test for a common fault and say, this is very likely to be SMA or this is very unlikely to be SMA and be very 
or f fairly definitive about that. Um, in black families, if the baby tests negative, we can't say this is not SMA. And we may well have to go on to additional tests like muscle biopsies to confirm the diagnosis um, because at the moment we don't have a blood test or a genetic test that can actually make that diagnosis. She says muscle biopsies are invasive and expensive. Muscle biopsies have to be done under anaesthetic. And if you're looking for SMA, you generally have a very sick child who is having difficulty breathing, who may be a severe anaesthetic risk. So it can be very difficult and very risky for the baby to do, or the child, to do a muscle biopsy. The initial research raised more questions, which new technologies may be able to answer. We've just reinitiated the project now because there are some new technologies around that may allow us to get a better handle on what is happening in the black SMA patients. So we know that that there are black SMA patients, that the disease is clinically almost identical to the white patients, but at the genetic level, we don't quite understand it. If they succeed, Africa will have its own way of accurately detecting the disease in all its citizens. So probably two, two years or so before we actually have run enough patients to get an idea of what's going on. That's all from us here at the National Health Laboratory Service. Please do give us your feedback via Twitter, email or Facebook. You've been watching Checkpoint and I'm in Gepilia Mabuse.